right, so um, since you just did those lab parts, um, that part where we talk about chemoreceptors and the sense of smell and the sense of taste are a little bit further down the road here. Um, we're going to start with hearing. First of all, what are the five senses? Smell, sight, sight, touch, and hearing. Hearing, there you go. Good. Okay, so we have specific sense organs associated with each type of sense. And what's unique is if someone loses or is born without the ability to use one of those, they have a unique ability to really hone in on the other four, or if it's two that are affecting the other three. And so um, if I had time, I would show you a video of uh, people that can actually use, like, that are blind, that can use echolocation like a bat or a dolphin with clicking. And they can, they're so honed in on the sense of hearing that they can use that to get around or to image something. It's pretty cool. But <clears throat> those of us that have all five senses, the one that typically tends to be most dominant is vision because you have such a huge part of your brain dedicated solely to interpreting what you see. Sensory receptors are found in high concentrations in the sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and skin. The eye is a sense organ specialized to collect visual data. The ear is a sense organ specialized for detecting sound and maintaining balance. The nose detects airborne chemicals, while the mouth detects chemicals in the foods we eat. The skin is the largest organ of the body. It contains many sensory neurons. Okay. The skin is oh, I thought I could really do that. The skin is unique because it has so many different types of sense or, uh, receptors in it. It can detect changes in temperature with thermal receptors. It can detect pressure. It can detect vibration. All of those different things use different types of uh, receptors in the skin. So um, a lot of those that I described are mechanoreceptors. There's actually even mechanoreceptors that detect tension in the ligaments, so your joints. So if you couldn't see, you could still tell how much your arm is bent just by the tension on those ligaments and, and receptors in those tissues to be able to, to detect, yeah, okay, my arm is bent about 70 degrees. And it's, it's kind of weird, but you do that. Photoreceptors, what are photoreceptors going to detect? Light. Light. Photo means light. And so this is what you're going to use for vision. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in depth. Chemoreceptors are going to detect different chemicals, whether it's the sense of smell or the sense of taste. Thermoreceptors, obviously, are going to respond to changes in temperature. Now, that's changes in temperature, not exact temperatures. And you can do a lab, I usually do it in anatomy and physiology, where you have different buckets, and you have cold water, room, lukewarm water, and then you have hot water. And depending on which way you go, the lukewarm water feels either really cold or really hot. If your hand is in the cold ice bucket, it's gonna be cold, or it's gonna be warm. If you have your hand in hot water and then you put it in that bucket, it's gonna feel cold. You can't tell the difference, all you're detecting is that change in temperature. And if you have too big of a swing, or you're below or above certain temperatures, it starts to set off pain receptors, which is why if you get it in the ice bath and it's too cold, it starts to hurt. So eventually you go numb. Um, so all of this stuff is controlled by electrical impulses from specific receptors to specific areas of the brain. And again, you can do an EEG, and when you're doing certain tasks and setting off certain receptors, you can see specific areas of the brain light up as you process that input.
So hearing. Hearing is obviously done by the ears, and I have a lovely little model right here that I can pass around for you. Um, how it starts, you have the oracle or um, the outer ear right here that is shaped to help funnel sound in from the front side. So typically you hear best when sound is coming in either from directly to from the side or from the front. A little bit more difficult to hear from behind just because of the way the ear is shaped. It funnels the vibrations in the air into the ear and it goes and strikes the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, okay? Which on this thing is this little gray piece of tissue right here, okay? That vibration is then passed through the three smallest bones in the body called, oh, I didn't come back. I'll come back to it. Okay, so the tympanic membrane does divide off the middle ear from the outer ear. And you always have to make sure that you equalize the pressure between the middle ear and the outside pressure, or it pushes on the eardrum one way or the other. If the pressure outside is higher, it pushes the eardrum in. If the pressure inside the ear is higher than outside air pressure, it pushes out, and that can be very painful. That's why if you go scuba diving and stuff and you start going down into depth, you have to constantly clear your ear or put pressure into your middle ear to equalize that pressure because there's a lot more pressure outside at that point and it hurts and you can actually rupture your eardrum if you don't do that. Same thing with flying. Why do you have to pop your ears when you fly? Because when you go up, there's less pressure up there. There's less air molecules pushing on the eardrum and so you have to clear your ears to reset the pressure on each side of the eardrum. You do that through your station tubes that run into the middle ear that go down into your throat. So you, um, when we dissect the frog, you're gonna be able to see the frog's eustachian tubes that help to do that for the frog as well. Um, sometimes when you get an ear infection, that fluid in there, first of all, is pushing on the eardrum and that causes the pain. And you can see that and you can see it's irritated and, and kind of bending outward. But it also kind of blocks these station tubes. And it's very hard to equalize pressure there. So you're not supposed to go scuba diving if you have an ear infection because you can rupture the ear. We had a um, question in Quizquist about the that eustachian tube, uh -huh. and nobody could figure out what it was. And Maddox Smith said the pumpkin tube. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> very different. Okay, yeah. so the eustachian tube, now you know. Okay, it's there to. to Equalize pressure within the ear. Tympanic membrane. Hey, in the frog, sound receptors are located in the inner ear, which is embedded within the skull. Sounds are transmitted to this organ by the tympanic membrane or eardrum and the columella, a small bone that extends between the tympanic membrane and the inner ear. Sounds first strike the tympanic membrane, which is usually located on the side of the head just behind the eye. Vibrations of the tympanic membrane are converted to nerve impulses by sensitive hair cells and are transmitted to the brain. All right. So what happens is the tympanic membrane vibrates and it causes the vibration of the three small bones in the ear. The auditory ossicles are called. Okay. They are, in layman's terms, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And you'll really see that when I pass this around, the stirrup looks like a stirrup on a saddle. Okay. Can we borrow a stirrup? Stirrup? You bet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So the auditory ossicles will start to vibrate. One vibrates into the other one, which goes into the other one, and on through what's called the oval window into the inner ear, where the actual reception of vibration occurs. Inside this coiled tube that looks like a snail is the cochlea. Now, if you can see the cochlea on this, 
Does it go a little blue? It looks it's a little blue thing. It looks like a snail. Yep. Okay. Inside there are hair cells. They're not actually hair. It's not your hair. Okay. They're more like cilia, ciliated cells that are of different sizes that bend only to certain frequencies. We kind of talked about this a little bit more. So when you hear middle C, middle C causes the vibrations of only certain hair cells in those ears, and they bend. When they bend, it opens sodium channels, causing that whole domino effect that we talked about before. Goes to the brain, the brain knows, okay, these are the specific hairs that are bending, Right now, you hear middle C. And depending on the volume, determines how much those hair cells bend. And the more they bend, the more significant those action potentials are, you interpret sound levels, okay? The problem is, again, if you, the higher the frequency, the thinner those hairs, the more frequently they break. And so, if you listen to loud noises frequently, it will break off those smaller cells. They're not repaired or replaced, and you start to lose hearing, particularly at high pitches first. Now, obviously, if you're around loud noises all the time, all of those different frequencies can be affected, and so you can basically become deaf. So like when, when you lose <coughs> hearing as you age, is that just the same thing? Yes, that's what it is. Typically, that's what it is. And is it always like really loud, or, or is it just, be Sometimes because they've been used for so long. Um, I think loud noise is accelerated very quickly. Um, there are, I, I read this in other physiology books, that um, there are tribes, tribal people in Africa that aren't around of those loud noises that can hear just as well as you can hear right now that are like 80 years old. But the average person here at 80 years old can't hear like that. So, like, Music and that kind of thing does it. Yep. So going to concerts. Concerts are bad. Really? Uh, honestly, the worst thing is our headphones. Really? We listen to music way too loud. I'm guilty of it. Mm -hmm. You know. So yeah, it's significant. Well, I'm just gonna help by the time I'm in you go to have some. In Europe, there's a decibel level that manufacturers can make, like iPods and stuff, go up to. You can't you can't go beyond that level. So we try to help protect here. Yeah. I think we have those. Well, I remember I used to have like I used to have that before I had my phone, I used to have like this band that was on my phone. And it was like if you go higher than a certain it was like if you turn from like the other location to like yeah. five, this is just like you. Yep, mine does that still, my S80 or whatever. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you ignore it and you turn it up beyond that and you thread. Yep. Okay, so we talked about the hair cells. I'm going to skip over this because um, I got to keep moving along. I can go ahead and play this quick. Sound wave vibrations in the air pass through the auditory canal and cause the tympanic membrane or eardrum to vibrate. These vibrations are transmitted through the small bones of the middle ear to the oval window, a thin membrane which separates the middle ear from the inner ear. The inner ear contains the cochlea, a special sensory organ that converts the vibrations into nerve impulses. The cochlea is a long coiled tube consisting of three fluid-filled chambers. The organ of corti is found in the middle chamber. The membrane below it contains reed-like fibers. Differences in the physical characteristics of these fibers allow them to vibrate in response to different frequencies of sound. As a vibration pushes on the oval window, the fluid inside the cochlea is set in motion. The wave travels through the cochlea until it vibrates a fiber whose natural frequency matches its own. This motion causes the bending of very small hairs and the excitation of the nerve fibers at their base. Because only certain fibers vibrate, only certain nerve cells are excited. The nerve impulses travel along the auditory nerve until they reach the auditory centers in the brain where they are interpreted as sound. Okay, so now there could be other damage besides the hair cell, right? There could be other issues with nerve impulses and things like that. The cochlea itself could be damaged. Um, at that point, then people lose hearing or are deaf because of those things. You can get a cochlear implant that can help with that. Um, 
there, yeah, there are just so many different things. But that is the most common with hearing loss, is breaking off these hair cells and damaging them. Okay, the ears are also used for more than simply hearing. They're also used for detecting movement and your the position of your head in, in relation to your body, okay? It does that by fluid inside the semicircular canals, a separate chamber, just for movement and stuff. There are cells in there that respond to the movement of the fluid, just like taking a level. If you've ever used a level before and it has the bubble in there, when you tip it, the fluid moves, the bubble moves then, okay? The fluid moves in this part of your ear, it bends cells, again, it excites them, goes up to the brain, the brain then interprets, hey, your head is angled slightly to the right. Hey, your head is angled slightly forward. Hey, you're moving right now. Okay, so all of that information is processing. Now, when you spin around really fast, all that fluid sloshes around, it confuses the brain because it keeps getting all these different signals and you get dizzy. And that's how that happens. Again, we really depend on sight when it comes to head position and stuff just because we've become so used to being able to see our surroundings. So then you really get messed up like if it's dark because you can't see at that point. Or if you're blindfolded. Vision. Vision is controlled by um, photoreceptors in the retina, which is the very inside back layer of the eye. Okay, so um, at the back of that eye is pigmented area right here that has photoreceptors on it that detect different things in light. Okay, um, in order for light to get there, it has to pass through two other layers. So initially, it goes through the outside layer, which most of it is the white part here, called the sclera. Okay. The clear part, still made of epithelial tissue, kind of like your, your skin cells are, but it's clear, there's no pigment to it at all, okay, is the cornea, and you can scratch that. If anybody's ever done that, it doesn't feel very good. Okay. So light can pass through the cornea, and then inside the next layer, is the iris, which is the pretty part of your eye. It is pigmented and gives it its color. But that iris has muscle cells in it that can contract and dilate. That changes the size of the pupil, which the pupil is legitimately just a hole. And so light can pass through. Well, your brain tries to control how much light passes through so you don't damage the retina by allowing too much light in. So in a bright room, they can shrink down a little bit and just allow enough light to come. Okay, that's why if you go to the eye doctor and they put the drops in your eye that dilates your eyes, you have to wear the sunglasses and stuff because sunlight can damage the retina when it, when your eyes when your pupils are that big. So light passes through, goes through the pupil, and right there is the lens. There are muscle cells connected to the lens that bend it in order for you to focus. And as light hits the lens, it should be all refracted to a single point on the retina. And if the image is cast appropriately, you interpret a pretty clear image. If it isn't, and the light is refracted, unlike it's supposed to on the retina, your vision is blurry. And that's why we have corrective lenses to fix that problem. Okay, or you actually have to go and have LASIK done where they reshape the lens with the laser and then it can refract the light correctly. Okay. How do they ever figure out how to like, make lenses that would work for people's eyes? Like, that just amazes me. Uh, it's a mixture of bio, biology and physics. Numbers. So here you can see that there's the cornea, there's the iris, there's the pupil. There's your lens. Back here, the actual retina, and this is the optic nerve that takes that information. Okay? 
The actual photoreceptors are rods and cones. The difference is rods allow you to see black and white. So when you're in dim light, you can see images kind of in grayscale. If you're in light, you use cones. So the best, the best way to remember this is think orange cones in construction. That'll help you think, okay, cones are in color. You actually have about 20 times more rods than you do cones, which is surprising because we usually use the cones. But the cones are usually centered in the best field of vision. When you, direct, when you stare directly at an object, that casts the image on the best field of vision in light where the most of the cones are at. Okay, And so we see in color. When you move into a dark room, the cones don't work. There's not enough light. So you need the rods to take over. That takes some time. What happens is a chemical called retinol and another chemical called opsin converge, bond together to make what's called rhodopsin, which turns on the rods. It takes about 30 seconds to a minute for that chemical reaction to take place and the rods start to work, which is why if you walk into school and you go into the auditorium and it's dark, and you gotta walk through there, you can't see a dark thing when you first walk in. But if you just wait and are patient, all of a sudden things start to clear up a little bit and you can at least maneuver because in that dim light, your rods finally turn on and you can see in grayscale. The problem with it is, if you look directly at an object in the dark, it casts it on the part of the retina that's mostly cones. So you don't see it very well. If you look just off to the side, it'll cast the image away from that spot, and you can actually see a little bit better by looking slightly away from the object you're trying to see, because it puts the image in a different spot. As soon as you walk into bright light, wham, it breaks apart retinal and opsin, and you start seeing in color pretty much instantaneously. <laughs> The structures of the eye act together to focus light on the retina, the light-sensitive inner layer of the eye. The optic nerve transmits the information to the occipital lobe. Lying deep within the retina are rods and cones, photoreceptors that translate light energy into electrical signals that can be interpreted by the brain. Rods and cones are embedded in the pigment layer of the retina. First, the light must pass through the vitreous humor then through other specialized helper cells. Cones absorb colors. They function mainly in daylight or highlight conditions. There are cones that respond to primarily red, blue, or green light. When a combination of cones is stimulated by light, we see millions of different colors. Rods contain only one type of light-sensitive pigment, which distinguishes between light and dark. They help the eye distinguish shape and track movement. At night or in low light, when cones are not very effective, we rely heavily on our rods. Okay, so just from three different colors, red, blue, and green, depending on the numbers of those that are set off, the combination of all of those that get set off is interpreted by our brain as a combination of all kinds of different shades and colors, which is pretty cool. So you aren't actually detecting all of those individual colors, you're getting a combination of those and your brain interprets the color that you see, which is why color blindness happens. You have a hard time seeing or interpreting certain shades. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I think, I think this is gonna push me back a little ways a day. So I'll have to come up with a plan and I'll let you know what it is. But um, I am gonna have you guys, I did share, the senses worksheet with you. Um, you can get through it and finish it all, or you can finish it tomorrow after we go through everything. Um, but at least you can get a jump on it. And obviously you can use your book and get through the taste, smell, and touch. So I will stop it there.